I wanted to first acknowledge that today we are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, who are the Indigenous people of this land. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, their community today resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Sockbridge Muncie Community Band of Mohican Indians. And if you are not familiar with them, they do have an office down on Spring Street uh, in Williamstown, and they also have a website, mohican.com, where you can learn about their culture and their language and their history. This star. And dollars that they're on. We also we pay and honor wait, we pay honor and respect to their ancestors, both past and present, as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. All right. So good evening and welcome to Sheep Hill, or for those of you online joining us remotely to Sheep Hill. For those of you who I haven't met, my name is Dana Williams. I'm the programs director for Williamstown Rural Lands. And for those of you who are familiar with Williamstown Rural Lands, we are a member supported land trust in the area with a focus on education, conservation and recreation. Our mission is to conserve and promote the forests, fields, farms and natural habitats of our local area for the benefit of our communities and for future generations. We currently preserve over 3,500 uh, acres of prime land in Williamstown and also maintain 60, over 60 miles of public access trails. And our headquarters are here at Sheep Hill where we hold events such as this one, as well as uh, kids programs, book groups, our classes, anything else you might want to engage with to engage with nature. So welcome also to our fourth conversation in the Knowing Your Landscape series. Knowing Your Landscape is a combined effort of our Working, hand, working Lands, Working Hands, and Talks on the Hill series. And this is specifically focused on providing information to landowners on land stewardship so that you can help to help you make management decisions. Sorry, and I have to scroll down on my thing. It's over here somewhere. The problem of having two screens. Um, it's this way. I do. Never mind. I'll just wing it. <laughs> okay. So today we're going to be talking about how to manage your land for wildlife habitat, and we are joined by some biologists from Mass Wildlife. We have Marianne Pichet, who has been a habitat biologist with Mass Wildlife, I believe for over 15 years. She has lots of experience working with private landowners, land trusts, um, organizations, and other groups in managing land. And then we're also joined by Alec Kaysand and Sarah Wasserman, who are biomap outreach specialists with Mass Wildlife. So for those of you online, um, if you have any questions, you can just add them into chat and I will be monitoring that. If there's anything I can answer, I will do it then, but otherwise we will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. So with that, I will turn it over to our speakers and we'll start. Great, thank you so much. Hi everyone. Uh, we appreciate you inviting us to speak with you today. Uh, as Dana said, my name's Sarah and I'm joined by my colleague, Alec, and we are both biomap outreach specialists with Mass Wildlife. And our job is to assist with outreach and user assistance for the new biomap. Today or tonight, I should say, we are going to begin with some background on the new biomap and then do a demonstration of the website and the online map. Uh, this will be followed by Mary Ann's presentation and then some time uh, for questions and discussion. So let's, let's begin. As you are all aware, Massachusetts is teeming with life. It's nearly 3 million acres of forest, 1,500 miles of coastline, vast network of rivers and critical wet wetlands support diverse natural ecosystems which provide habitat for a wide variety of plants and animals. These natural systems offer vital ecological benefits. They filter our air, clean our water, provide food and economic opportunities, mitigate the detrimental effects of climate change, and provide us with recreation opportunities, all of which enrich the quality of our lives. However, despite significant progress and conservation successes, our biodiversity is in crisis at the global, national, and state scale. 
According to the National Wildlife Red Federation report from 2018, one third of species in the United States are vulnerable and one in five species are at high risk of extinction. In Massachusetts, we currently have 432 species on our endangered species list. Threats to our biodiversity include such things as habitat loss and fragmentation, invasive species and emerging diseases. And all of these are being compounded by climate change. A recent UN climate report recognized the interdependence of climate, ecosystems, biodiversity, and human societies. If we want to reverse these trends, urgent action is needed. And that brings us here today to introduce you to Biomap, the future of conservation in Massachusetts. As you may or may not know, Massachusetts has a long history of being a leader in the development of groundbreaking conservation tools. First with Biomap in 2001, Living Waters in 2003, and then Biomap 2 in 2010. Over the years, these products have provided a framework for protection and stewardship of lands and waters critical for biodiversity conservation. It's been he heavily utilized by land trusts, state agencies, municipalities, and others, and has been considered a trusted and credible source of information. Biomap is the result of an ongoing collaboration between Mass Wildlife and the Massachusetts chapter of the Nature Conservancy, with similar missions, goals, and science-based approaches to conservation, Mass Wildlife and TNC are natural partners to produce and maintain Biomap. And with this latest iteration of Biomap, we go even further. Biomap is more than a map. It is a map, a tool, and a vision. For the people of the Commonwealth to come together to strategically protect manage and restore lands and waters that are most important for conserving biodiversity in Massachusetts now and into the future. As with Biomap 2, conservation targets are grouped into two main components, core habitat and critical natural landscapes. Core habitat identifies areas that are critical for the long-term persistence of rare species and a wide diversity of resilient ecosystems. Critical natural landscape identifies large landscapes and habitat buffers that enhance resilience, maintain connectivity, and support ecological processes. Together, core and critical natural landscape make up 2.4 million acres, 44% of which is currently protected. Over 90% of Biomap 2 is included in this iteration of Biomap. There is some amount of shift in the areas with, within core habitat and critical natural landscape, some Biomap 2 areas have been removed due to things like new development, and this iteration of Biomap includes new areas due to things like new data and methodology. Taking a deeper dive into core habitat and critical natural landscape, you'll find components such as aquatic, forest, and rare species cores, landscape blocks, wetland buffers, and coastal adaptation areas. We've updated the data layers with the latest information on species and habitats and enhanced some components such as aquatic core with new methodologies. This iteration of Biomap also includes new local and regional components, which Alec will introduce in a moment. The interactive Biomap website, which I'll be showing in a few minutes, also includes numerous resources such as story maps, which walk the user through what Biomap is, the pieces of Biomap and how to use it. We also provide fact sheets which help users understand the data, methodology, and conservation strategies for each of these components. I will now pass it off to Alec to talk more about local components. Thanks, Aaron, and thanks for having us tonight. So as I said, uh, one of the key innovations we've incorporated into the new Biomap is the addition of local data. We've received feedback over the years that since Biomap 2 um, wasn't really as relevant to all cities and towns as it could be. Almost every town in the state has core and critical natural landscape, but our municipalities are very different from one another and some amount of habitat varies significantly among them. So we're excited to unveil this new municipal level data. And to show you with an example, um, this map shows our landscape blocks, at, which is a component of the critical natural landscape. 
Landscape blocks identify large intact mosaics of forests, wetlands, and freshwater habitat. Uh, these areas support wide ranging species like moose and black bear, and also the resilience and abundance of many wildlife and plant species. So these were analyzed from a statewide perspective, but those landscape blocks are more abundant in some parts of the state and, than others, and, and many cities and towns don't have any. So if we add in that local version of landscape blocks called local landscapes and that light green that you see in the map, the most intact natural landscapes in, the, in each city and town are now identified. You can see it really just fills out that map a lot more. And that local component will make Biomap relevant and applicable for many more communities. So if we take a closer look at Williamstown as an example and that surrounding landscape we can see, uh, the new Biomap data identifies about 49.3% of Williamstown as core habitat, you can see in that dark green, and 75.2% as critical natural landscape in the lighter green. And so these are those priorities from the statewide perspective. But if we add in the additional local components, about 2.1% more of Williamstown has habitat prioritized to inform that municipal decisions. Uh, however, some of the local data does overlap with that statewide data. So for an example, we can see down in the uh, southwest corner near Caretaker Farms property, uh, there's an additional local wetlands and buffers to support that aquatic core and rare species core in that area. And so in looking at the map, it is easy to see how every town now has more complete understanding of that important habitats within their boundaries. But it is important to note that this local data does not replace that statewide data. It does complement it and adds to it. So it's important to use these together. And we often keep them uh, in this view where you have the uh, core and critical natural landscapes and add it in with the local on top. If we wanted to also take a look at protected open space in the area, uh, you can add in the, the protected open space layer to help with priority setting. So what's already protected, what highlighted areas intersect with the biomap data, what areas don't or aren't currently protected. Approximately 46% of the biomap footprint in, in Williamstown is currently protected. And if we take a look at the properties that the foundation manages, uh, we can identify those on the map that you see here from that protected open space layer. Uh, there are two additional properties I wanted to note that aren't currently in that protected layer. Uh, you can see the red stars there. That's the Buxton Brook Preserve in the Northwest and Judge Tiffany Nature Preserve in the Southwest corner. And then also if we wanted to take more depth analysis at kind of the properties or projects going on um, and just in collaboration with Mass Wildlife, there's a few examples like Pine Cobble in the corner here that you see, a newer restoration collaboration project that's still in that planning stage. Uh, we're looking at a series of high elevation pitch pine health, uh, heath bulbs on that border of, of Williamstown and Clarksburg. Um, that re recent history of fire exclusion and is the focus of that project and collaborating to get that prescribed fire regime in place. And looking at how the biomap data in that area could inform the the planning process could be really interesting and, and see how that overlaps. And we'll go over kind of those additional uh, habitat and restoration resources that are included as well. And then another study, uh, B Hill, and looking at that, a partnership again on a restoration project, removing white pine from the limestone cobble is that, you know, generalist white pine is, is a typical indicator of the habitat degradation. Uh, so you can see in the boundary there, um, although not the whole area has significant, or a lot of biomap data within the boundary, it is supporting a lot in the area. Uh, so you can see a, a couple of different examples and, and Sarah will go in depth uh, with the demo in just a bit. Uh, but you can see how the, the layers kind of overlap here, uh, just adjacent to it. And then you also have in this light green, the regional connectivity, which I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, but this is just another example of how biomap data can help inform management decisions, whether it's within the, your boundaries or supporting the area around it. And so I mentioned that regional connectivity, if we zoom out on the other end of the scale, uh, we wanted to identify habitats that are, make a significant contribution to conservation at scales larger than Massachusetts. So a recent study showed that the tree populations in Eastern US are moving north and west at approximately 10 miles per decade in response to climate change. And one example here in Massachusetts that's pictured here is the tulip tree. Uh, it's just visible and down, or, currently down in the southeast corner, but moving its way up and looking at the regional connectivity in this way uh, can help us identify areas that support these large scale range shifts. Uh, also, while not pictured here, their biomap also identifies important habitat for rare species that are 
highly vulnerable at regional, national, or global scales. So the new innovations of local and regional data giving us a lot of perspective at different scales. I'll pass it back to Sarah. Thanks, Alec. At this point, I wanted to take a moment to highlight the difference between Biomap and another map you may be familiar with, which uh, is offered through the Natural Heritage Atlas known as Priority Habitat. Priority Habitat is codified under the Massachusetts Endangered Species Act, and it is a regulatory screening tool to allow the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program to review projects or activities for impacts to the state listed species. This is different from Biomap, which is non regulatory and is fundamentally a tool to plan and prioritize conservation actions. Just want to take a moment to acknowledge that distinction. And as we can see through Biomap's interactive map, which I will demonstrate in just a few moments, users can customize the data display to meet their interests and needs. For example, you can filter by specific components and select data that is more relevant at either local or statewide scales. The map also includes an exciting tool that allows the user to derive information for an area of interest. As with Biomap 2, the data are also downloadable for use in other analyses. Uh, and they are also available in the Mass Mapper online tool. Biomap as a tool supports a wide variety of conservation strategies. Land protection is an essential such strategy. It allows municipalities, land trusts, and agencies to stop habitat loss and fragmentation, ultimately preventing the loss of biodiversity. Biomap helps practitioners focus conservation funding and effort on critically important habitats that are either partially or entirely unprotected, leading to long-term legal protection and habitat resilience. While land protection is essential, it is often not enough. Over 40% of rare and declining species in Massachusetts require active management of their habitats. Therefore, habitat restoration and management are key elements of the Commonwealth's Biomap Conservation Strategy. Biomap now includes a new Habitat Restoration Resource Center that will provide our conservation partners with recommendations and resources for stewardship actions that promote habitat resilience, restore ecological processes, and prepare for, recover from, and adapt to climate change. Biomap's Habitat, Habitat Restoration Resource Center provides guidance to land managers on restoration and management priorities and site planning. It includes fact sheets that have information on the different upland, wetland, and aquatic habitat types in Massachusetts, and on specific practices such as prescribed fire, mowing and mulching, and invasive plant control. The Habitat Restoration Resource Center... Oh, sorry. Uh, the Habitat Restoration Resource Center also includes resources for technical assistance and identifies potential funding opportunities. And I'll pass it back over to Alec. Oh, you're muted. I think I get the hang of that by now. Another key innovation uh, we've added in the deliberate addition of the climate resiliency data from the Nature Conservancy. Uh, so for example, you can see in the top right here, the resilience sites, or you may be familiar with the resilience uh, land mapping tool that they have. And uh, the green areas identify places that allow species to move to suitable habitat in response to changes in temperature and precipitation. And so we built these directly into a few different layers uh, to help with that. So the wetland core, the forest core, and the landscape blocks now include this data specifically. And it's not meant to replace that need for the resilience land mapping tool if you're using that for funding or for research, uh, but it is now built into Biomap and, and plays into where those uh, polygons now exist. And similarly, the Mass Wildlife Fisheries team identified freshwater systems that allow species to persist and thrive in, context, in the context of climate change. So this includes uh, climate change refugia, which are uh, rivers that support cold water fish as water temperatures uh, rise, including the iconic native brook trout that you see here. Biomap will continue to support conservation planning and funding, informing those millions of conservation dollars each year. 
Um, this not only makes sense from a conservation perspective, but it provides a high return on investment for our conservation dollars because those biomap habitats are designed to stand the test of time and support biodiversity and resiliency now and long into the future. Uh, some two examples that we have here, uh, you may be familiar with the Essex County Greenbelts, a uh, very rigorous land prioritization process, and also the Mount Grace and North Quabbin Regional Landscape Partnerships uh, assessment of resiliency, biodiversity, and other values. So just like two examples of uh, including that biomap in uh, planning and funding. Uh, you may also be familiar with the Department of Conservation Science grants. Uh, they build this directly into how they evaluate projects for grant funding. Uh, and their use of that biomap really guides it. Uh, of course, part, uh, you know, along with other, other sources like TNC. Uh, as we know, many of these best conservation projects are collaboration among multiple org organizations and agencies. And so we've heard that Biomap really is a key tool in bringing people together and fostering these robust partnerships. So Biomap really envisions a future in which the people of the Commonwealth invest in the strategic protection and stewardship of lands and waters that are most important for con conserving bi biodiversity. And in this future, these vital natural systems continue to protect us against the damaging effects of climate change. They continue to provide clean air, clean water, employment opportunities, and beautiful spaces for recreation. And they continue to ensure that all Massachusetts residents have access to nature and enjoy that be the benefits of our rich natural heritage. And with Biomap, we can protect those extraordinary biodiversity and vibrant qualities of life now and for future generations. And so we want to just uh, Acknowledge it would, this would not have been possible without the financial support from the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, uh, the Department of Fish and Game, Mass Wildlife, the Nature Conservancy, and numerous donors, as well as the development of the nuts and bolts of Biomap were truly that team effort involving numerous people and organizations, some of which listed here. So we're just very thankful for their work and wanted to mention. And now Biomap is a living product. So if you're familiar, uh, with the website already, or if you're not, you can now see it at mass.gov forward slash biomap. We want to make biomap as useful as possible. And part of Sarah and I's work here is to gain feedback and have conversations that we can provide uh, resources like tutorials and webinars in the coming months and provide technical assistance as users are um, working through the data and, and the website. So we have uh, our general email if you want to follow up with any questions. Obviously, we're going to have questions today. But if you have anything in the future, you can certainly contact us for, with this email. And we'd just love to hear any feedback, good or bad, that you have uh, about Biomap and how you're using it. So we know that was a lot of information very quickly. Um, I'm going to pass it to Sarah to give a quick demo of the Biomap website and the interactive mapper. Uh, and then we can continue the conversation from there. So we'll hopefully have a smooth transition to switch to you, Sarah. Fingers crossed. All right, how does that look? Looks good. Looks good? Great. All right, so when you go to that link, the mass.gov slash biomap, this is what you'll find. This is our home page. Um, and as you scroll down, you'll encounter some resources, the first of many. Um, these buttons here lead to uh, different resources about what is biomap, uh, the different biomap components, how to use Biomap, and what's new between the past versions and this new version. Uh, two of these, uh, the what is Biomap and how to use Biomap, are in story map format, which I will show what that looks like in just a moment. Um, but essentially, it's a more dynamic way to walk through the information. As we continue down, we see the interactive map itself. Uh, it's you can interact with it fully on the home page here, or if we just scroll down a bit more, you can click view full screen, which opens it in a new tab. And that's how we'll be looking at it in just a moment. Uh, but there it is. And at the bottom, just a few more, there's this data downloads and resources. So depending on how you interact with the data, if you're somebody who uses the uh, application ArcGIS on your desktop, you would find that data download uh, from this page. It also offers some of the fact sheets that we'll be showing in this uh, accessible location. The Habitat Restoration Resource Center, which we mentioned in the presentation, is also accessible. 
Uh, and we have this connect with us page. So reiterating what Alex said, we're really looking to hear feedback, uh, questions, thoughts, experiences. So please don't hesitate to reach out through that email or on this page, you can also find a survey form to fill out and submit that we will respond to you there. And those who are interested in learning more about supporting endangered species conservation can find that information here as well. So this is all on the home page. We can take a look at the biomap components, which we saw right here. It's also accessible in this top bar. So if you were to click that, this page really gives you that breakdown on all the different components uh, that go into core habitat, critical natural landscape, and the local and regional components. These are also in story map format. Um, and you can find the individual fact sheets a little bit further down. But I will show a story map. So if you were to click, for example, on core habitat, it will take you here. And you can see there's a section for all the different components. And as I scroll through, we can see it's a bit more dynamic than your typical static web page, has more images, and it has links. So when you get to the bottom, if you want to access those fact sheets, you can also click here where it says learn more. And it will take you to this page where you can find a bit more details, such as summary statistics, different methodology, uh, behind the local and regional aspects as well, and conservation strategy. So if, for example, you want to print this out, uh, you can do that as well. And these are all accessible from this components page. I'll move on to the Habitat Restoration Resource Center, which I showed on the bottom uh, section in the homepage, but it's also here at the top. This has uh, a similar grouping of resources in terms of story map format right here, the Habitat Restoration and Management, why it's important. Uh, we have a section on management priorities and planning, so I'll just show that. That page has uh, details on site planning, the five basic elements of a management plan, uh, and other ways to prioritize. We also offer management recommendations for the many different habitats that are in the state. So if I were to click there, you'll see it's grouped into upland, wetland, and aquatic habitats. And there are more fact sheets for all of these different types of habitats. So as you can see, there's plenty. I'm just going to choose one as an example. So if you were to click on vernal pools, this is what the format looks like. You can see it gives a definition, an image, and then it has three sections, habitat description, what particular threats uh, might be out there for this habitat, and restoration and management recommendations. So that's all within the Habitat Restoration Resource Center. And then this button at the bottom, if you're interested in learning more about technical support or funding. So that was a very brief walkthrough of some of the resources you can find on this website. I will now go to the interactive map. You can see also up on that top bar. When you click on that, this is the default view that you'll find. Um, you have a legend here on the right that shows you what you're looking at on the map. Your uh, classic zoom in, zoom out, this default extent. If uh, you're interested in looking at exactly where you were, this button here that looks a bit like a compass says my location. Um, I'll mention that Biomap does work on uh, smartphones. So for example, if you were in the field, and you wanted to see exactly where you were and what biomap might be there, that can uh, point to where you are. If you're interested in um, the visuals of the map, we have the space map gallery, so you could you know, change the background. For example, if you wanted something a bit more uh, image-based, you could use that. I'm gonna go back to the canvas one just for visuals. And then here in the center is our data panel, and it's kind of where the magic happens. Um, where you can select and deselect. As you can see, some of these are gray. Uh, that just means you're not at the right scale. 
So you want to make sure that the data you're interested in looking at, you're at the proper scale to see it. So that it's visible on the map and that you're able to select it. I'm going to use this bar up here to search for a location. As you can see, it'll take you there. There's this pop-up window, which uh, pops up when you're clicking on a polygon on the map. So as we can see now, permanently protected open space, which was once gray, is now visible. And we can also see that we have all of these options. So let's take a look. If I wanted to see the core habitat components broken up into all of these different sections and same with the critical natural landscape components. I can select these and you'll see the legend changes automatically. We're not seeing them right now because they are below the biomap elements, which are those broader groupings of the core habitat and critical natural landscape. But if I were to deselect it, now all the colors are visible, which is really exciting uh, visually just to see. We were to zoom in and click around a bit. If you were to click in one particular location that has multiple components, such as right here, you'll see in the corner, it says one of five. So first, this panel will tell us about rare species. And then this triangle, you can click to move through. We have forest core, aquatic core, landscape blocks, and the aquatic core buffer. So those pop-up windows are really helpful and interactive. We turn on permanently protected open space. I'll tab through and see, oh, I clicked on Taconic Trail State Park. We also have an assessor's parcels tool, I mean layer, <laughs> which is also scale dependent. So you have to be zoomed in far enough to see it, but it's there and local components, as you can see, is another scale dependent one, which is now visible. I'm going to finish this demo by looking at the summary report tool. So as you can see, when you click on the summary report, which is this one that kind of has the magnifying glass and the image, you can search a place such as Williamstown and it can run a report on the entire town or you can draw, and there's two different options for drawing. There's this uh, freehand polygon where you can just draw any shape, um, or you can select by rectangle, um, and that lets you select based on a certain layer. So you can do this for the parcels layer. I'll just do a quick demonstration. Reactivate the parcels. You can see at first it was gray. I zoomed in a bit. There it is. If I were to click here, Assessor's Parcels, you see it says next to my mouse, press down to start and let go to finish. I'll draw a quick little shape. And there we go. It highlights just that parcel. So that's a, that's a neat tool. I'm going to do the, the freehand draw and I'll just click start over. And one of the examples we looked at in our presentation was a pine cobble, which as we can see is right there. And I'm going to do it a little bit quick, but I prepped a report in advance that I did a little bit more meticulously just for the sake of time. But you can see as I click to start drawing, I can trace the shape of these polygons. Pine cobble has an interesting shape. So I'm just going to do this a little bit quick but you can obviously take your time when you're looking at a specific location and following that border. But when I'm done, it says double click to complete. I can click report and it might take a minute to load, but when it does load, this print button will become available and you can choose the layout. So portrait is pretty basic, you know, letter format. You can click print. And as you can see, here it is. It provides you both a visual map with uh, a legend and a scale bar. You can add a caption, you can change the title. I will mention, make sure that um, 
whatever layers you'd like to see in your final map you have activated when you click that report button and that you have it positioned in a way that will kind of capture it in the orientation you'd like. Further down in the summary report, you can see it tells you how many different core habitat polygons you have and their acreage. And then it goes into a bit more detail, uh, breaking it down by first element and then component. And you can print this or you can save it as a, a PDF file. That brings me to the end of this demonstration. I will stop sharing my screen for now, but if there if questions do come up about how to do something, I'm happy to share it again and walk through that. But I wanna leave enough time for Marianne to, to uh, share her, her presentation. So I'm happy to pass, pass the microphone over to you. Okay, thank you. Um... I'm also happy to be here and thank the Royal, Williamstown Rural Land Foundation for um, inviting us to present during this series. Um, and as um, was mentioned before, I, I've been with Mass Wildlife working on this very sort of thing with private landowners um, for 15 years and using these tools that uh, Sarah and Alec have demonstrated to us, but not in this format. I'm really excited to see that this is now available for. The general public to really hone in and, and look at parcels like this and um, and be able to access this information for their own properties. It's been my job over this time as a habitat biologist um, working with private landowners, land trusts, and conservation organizations to, to bring this kind of information to landowners and share it with them about their properties and help them to plan um, habitat management projects for their properties. So I'm just going to kind of run through how um, how I kind of did that and the kinds of tools that I've used over time to do that that are that are out there and available for, for people to use. Um, so I'm gonna kind of jump off from the biomap from the new newly released biomap and talk about incorporating some of the other tools that we also have available on our website um, for people to look at and to use. So these are the um, the other things I want to talk about is a rare species viewer that we have on our website. Um, along with state listed species fact sheets, our state wildlife action plan, and then some resources available for helping landowners to plan habitat management and some resources for land protection, if, if that's something people are interested in doing. So I'm gonna just kind of go through, through these um, here. How do I advance my, how do I advance my slide? Does someone know? Oh, there the we go. Right. <laughs> Which button is it? The right arrow. Okay, thank you. So this is a kind of very messy version of what Sarah just showed us. So I'm glad that, that we saw her version. Um, and I'm actually using the older biomap layers here, which I access through um, GIS. So this is kind of how I would might go about looking at it. This is Williamstown and you're, you know, we're pretty much looking at the same layers that Sarah just showed us. Um, I want to highlight um, the priority habitat, which is in the bright yellow. So as um, Sarah mentioned before, priority habitat is, is regulatory. So, um, and this is mapped based on known occurrences of state listed species. So that's where in Williamstown we have, um, we have priority habitat. And the other layers that are included in biomap, I have a few other layers in here, um, like the certified and potential vernal pools, which if I were if I were looking at this um, as if it were a property, a landowner's property I were, was visiting, I would want to look at all of these different layers to see which layers are on the property and, you know, look at those areas of the property that um, had some of these layers or were in or who we might be able to identify as important areas to manage or conserve. So um, they're all here, the, the core and the the like the the wetland buffer is kind of the critical natural landscape layer of, of the new biomap. So I just kind of wanted to show this map to bring it back. Um, and then the rare species viewer, this is a website that we have where you can either search by um, town or search by the species if you have a particular interest in a certain um, species and where they're located throughout the state. But um, 
you can also search by town. So I went ahead and did that for Williamstown and came up with um, this list of species that are all state listed species that are known to occur in Williamstown, currently known. There may be others that haven't been discovered, but this is what we know of. 52 state listed species occur in Williamstown, um, 38 of which are plant species. So um, Williamstown is very rich with rare plants. Um, and I would imagine it's partly due to the elevation, the calcareous bedrock, or some other types of landscape features that might um, host these these particular plants. So this is what I would also do for a property, an individual property. If I were going to somebody's property and I saw that they had priority habitat on their property, um, I would look to see exactly what species were there because it, it's going to help us direct our, our, uh, our priorities for conservation. So if these are the state listed species in Williamstown, then these, you know, knowing where how to protect or manage for these species if they require it would be an important thing to do. So on a property-based level, this is the same thing that I would go about doing. So we also have on our website um, fact sheets for all of these state-listed species. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, there's 432 of those currently in or Alec might have mentioned that in Massachusetts. Um, so we have a fact sheet for all of them and they're again available through our heritage um, page on our website. So you can read about those any of those species that are you know, state listed in, in the town. Um, and they basically consist of a description of the species, what similar species, um, their ranges or their current ranges, some habitat management recommendations they have and the threats to the to those individual species. So our state wildlife action plan, um, we have we have a state wildlife action plan. We're required to have one if we want to receive grant funding through um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to to incorporate to it um, conduct any of the conservation actions that we've identified in the state wildlife action plan. You'll see here, this mentions that um, it presents the 570 species of greatest need conservation need in Massachusetts. So this not only includes the 432 species that are state listed, but other species that are also of plants and animals that are also declining. And, um, so we have to update this plan every 10 years. The first one was, was written in 2005. We have our current 2015 version and moving from updating our biomap is a major project that Mass Wildlife undertook. We are now gonna be stepping into updating our state wildlife action plan, which will again be another um, huge effort on the part of all of our staff to do that and identify um, all of the species of great, or, detail all of the species of greatest conservation need in the state and the habitat types on which they depend. So in this current version of our state wildlife action plan, um, it's a habitat-based approach. So there's 24 different habitat types that are identified in our current state wildlife action plan and all of the 570 species that are identified in it as species of greatest conservation need are linked to habitat types on which they depend. So um, for instance, the early hair streak, which I sort of just randomly, this is one of the species that's all the species pictured in this um, presentation are species that are in Williamstown from that list that I pulled from the rare species viewer. So early hair streak, the only habitat of the 24 habitat types in the state wildlife action plan that it's associated, most closely associated with is Northern hardwood spruce fir forests, which are um, pro the, probably the dominant forest type in Williamstown. So our state wildlife action plan gives information like those habitat fact sheets that are now on our new updated biomap are also in the state wildlife action plan. So now we've made those more readily available to people through our biomap and the fact sheets on the um, species. And again, as Sarah talked about too, we've got the habitat management guidelines that we're working on that are available um, through Biomap, um, the habitats for the state wildlife action plan habitat types. So now um, 
you, you, we can take all of this information and all of these layers and apply them to individual properties as was demonstrated through Biomap and something that I've been doing with private landowners in the time that I've been working as a habitat biologist. I'll you know, get an inquiry from somebody or they have an interest in managing habitat on their property. And um, I've been providing details on what they can do and also working to connect them with funding sources for that. So kind of taking all of that biomap information and all of that state wildlife action plan information and looking at how it's relevant for, for an individual's property and looking at the habitat types that currently exist on their property that I align with the state wildlife action plan habitat types, whether they're upland forest, forested swamps, vernal pools, grasslands, what have you, that somebody has on their property. And we think about what kinds of active habitat management might, management they might be able to conduct, taking into consideration the species that are likely to use those pads based on where the property is located in the state. So, you know, we're not necessarily going to have uh, Barron's buck moth in Williamstown. That's a species that occurs down on Cape Cod in the Pine Barren. So, you know, we're going to think about managing for species that are likely to benefit based on where the property is located. Um, and so, you know, kind of develop a plan for that. We also often work um, in coordination with a landowner's private forester if they have a forest stewardship plan for their property. And, 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 and oftentimes the habitat management is compatible with forest management activities that somebody may, that may be prescribed in their plan or that they may wanna conduct. So the primary sources of funding for habitat management on private land, land trust, conservation organization property um, are listed here. We have, through Mass Wildlife, we have a grant program. We're in the process, currently in the process of kind of modifying a bit and, and working to try and make it so that um, we're selecting, we're working, we're ranking projects and selecting projects that might need longer term restoration. Many of them often do. And landowners with the way that our funding has worked up to date, they can only get funded for one year. So we're working to try and select projects that might need multiple years of funding so that landowners can ensure that they're, they'll, be, they'll be able to get funding in the future for their project or continued funding, particularly for projects where there's more of a restoration component and it's going to take several years of management to restore a property. So um, that, is a, that is grant funding that we have through Mass Wildlife. What we focus on with that is um, that for the eligibility is lands that are have some level of protection. So either permanently protected lands or lands that are enrolled in the forest stewardship program might have the minimal amount of protection um, on the property. Properties that are not protected aren't eligible for our funding. We wanna make sure that we're investing in a property that um, is protected or conserved. So, um, we do continue to have that funding available and it does come through the state and every year we do need to wait to find out whether or not we actually um, will be receiving that, but we have, um, we have consistently received that funding. Another program some of you may be familiar with already is the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So that's um, funding that comes through the US Department of Agriculture um, and it's federal funding. Um, the Natural Resources Conservation Service has, has offices in every one of the 50 states, and they have district offices in the different counties of each state. So um, I've worked under partnership with them the majority of the time that I've been working at Mass Wildlife, direct, um, directly under partnership with them and their staff to visit properties and work with uh, other natural resource professionals to plan habitat management projects for um, landowners and conservation organizations. So they have not only uh, programs that will fund habitat management, but also they have easement programs. And the last program that um, I'll share with you tonight is, it is an NRCS funded um, uh, program called the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. And what, how that works is partners can join together and apply for funding through the Natural Resources Conservation Service to develop their own sort of grant program where they um, 
focus on a specific habitat or specific conservation goal. And so Mass Wildlife partnered with the Massachusetts Forest Alliance to, um, to apply for this funding through NRCS. So we currently have this, um, this source of funding available. And it, I'll talk about that in a little <laughs> more detail in a minute. Um, so through the Natural Resources Conservation Service, basically their funding programs that would fund habitat management are the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. So this is available to landowners um, to address natural resource concerns that are identified by um, the, natural, the, the um, natural Resources Conservation Service. So their air quality, water quality, soil health, and wildlife are the various uh, natural resource concerns that their programs address. And this is um, funding that's available. There are habitat management activities that can get funded through this, as well as forest management activities, and they can be funded in combination. Another program that they have that kind of um, is an offshoot, in a sense, of, of the Environmental Quality Incentive Program is the Conservation Stewardship Program, which um, if somebody has already conducted some habitat management or forest management on their property, but they have smaller activities or not as expensive activities that need to continue to be maintained, like um, spot treating invasive species or mowing fields or maybe um, doing some thinning in their forest, these activities can be funded through this program. They're, they're just sort of maintenance activities, if you will, rather than full out like management activities. So these are two programs that will fund like active habitat management. And then their easement programs, they have a wetland reserve easement program, which um, can protect wetlands that have been impacted by farming or forestry historically, or where um, farming activities are actually um, have taken place in those wetlands and the, um, those activities will cease and the wetlands will be restored. So they have funding that not only puts an easement on those wetlands or riparian corridors, but also has funding to restore them as well. So that's essentially habitat protection. It, this program is used a lot in the Southeastern Mass to um, restore cranberry bogs. And then there's a healthy forest reserve program, which um, landowners can have an easement put on their forest land. And that can also have a habitat management component um, included in it as well. So all of the standard habitat man activities might be conducted under the other programs can be done here as well. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about this, um, this NRCS um, funded regional conservation partnership program that Mass Wildlife um, received the funding along with the Massachusetts Forest Alliance. So it's, it functions just like the environmental quality incentive program, but it's a separate funding pool. So we have a staff member, um, Patrick Conlin, who um, works under this program to work with private landowners and land trusts and conservation organizations to develop um, funding applications for habitat management that would be funded through this particular um, funding pool under, under the EQIP um, program. And I will close there. I know I kind of ran through those things kind of quickly. I did want to make sure we left some time for questions. Um, and uh, that would be for uh, uh, directed to all of us. If, if folks are interested in habitat management, my contact information is here on the bottom left. And um, you can reach out to me and I can talk in more detail about any of these programs or um, uh, conservation tools that I talked about using for for your own property. Um, and Patrick Conlin, if you're interested in in that program, you could contact me as well, but he's also um, I listed his contact information there as well for for funding through that particular program. And again, I'd like to thank you all for being here and um, happy to share all this information with you and we'll take some questions now. I will say Sheep Hill, we have a CSP grant uh, for mowing and putting up some bird boxes here at Sheep Hill. We'll go to the grant 
program that Marilyn just mentioned. And we have an equip grant grant to um, develop a forest management plan for a new acquisition, a new donated piece of property. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that some folks are actually utilizing these programs and maybe can also serve as a resource to folks locally to talk about how these programs work and um, your experience with them as well. Yeah, yeah I worked yeah. actually, Sheep Hill was one of the first properties I ever visited when I was with Leslie when I was uh, first hired at Mass Wildlife. So I have been to Sheep Hill and and uh, f uh, management there was being funded through a previous habitat management grant that Mass Wildlife had called the Landowner Incentive Program. So our new grant has kind of replaced that old, older grant program. Good. Uh, I just will say for the view, for the participants, the funding pays for, in the case of Sheepville, the mower, and in the case of the forest management planning, it, it will pay for a forester private forest, practicing forest, to develop that plan with us. Um, so it doesn't pay us to go thin trees or anything. That's the next step. Is a plan. Right. Yeah. So that's um, one of the eligibility requirements for the Natural Resources Conservation Service is that your property either be farmland and you're an active, you know, farm producing agricultural products, or you're a forest landowner and you need to have a forest management plan for your property that prescribes the management that you want to conduct. For the Mass Wildlife Grant, you don't need to have either of those things, but you need to have, your land needs to have some level of protection. Oh, that's interesting. <clears throat> this is sort of a rookie question. Um, where would one, like where's sort of the entry portal for finding out what, what would be available. Like, who, who would like who would I contact if you know we have we have a particular piece of land? It used to be a field. We want to turn it into a forest. Um, it's turning out to be very expensive, so we're trying to find help in doing so. Like, where who would I talk to? Who would be sort of the first person I would talk? To? <clears throat> so there, I, that would be. You could contact me um, with this contact information here. Um, you said you need to have a forest stewardship plan prepared. No, no, um, no. It's just we're um, not yet. I mean, it doesn't qualify, from what my understanding, it doesn't qualify as a forest yet because it's kind of a, de a degraded field that we're trying to restore as a forest. But because it's not a forest yet. Um, it, it feels like it sort of falls between the two designations. Right, right, yeah. Um, does it sit on a larger block of land that is forested? It, it's adjacent to some um, okay. that, that are nearby, but but it itself it is it's most it's mostly old farmland. Yeah, I think kind of keeping any invasives that are present under control. Um, you know, it, it I haven't seen it, but it seems like it probably needs to just develop on its own, um, depending on how, how, how far along it is right now, it might not need any, any management. Yeah. Right. That management is me with a matter. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so I'm just sort of looking yeah. to, for other, if there are other ways, maybe doing it at a larger scale. Like there shouldn't be restoration grants. Like planting trees and, you know, um, but all of it that I'm sort of learning is, is costing a lot more than. Um, so, so anyway, it, it just added, if other people had a similar kind of question, I thought I would ask, but it sounds like you're somebody one could reach out to as sort of like an entry point, maybe that, um, that, that could direct me or, or tell me that there's, there's not some, a you know, clear path, but um, because I've heard about some of the programs, but it wasn't sort of clear which which who to who to approach or what sort of where to start. Yeah, and the web, our website does have that that Sarah showed. Um, I don't know if I should exit this. Um, <clears throat> the um, 
habitat management resources page, it's the um, technical and financial assistance for landowners. Thank you. That has, yeah, that has a lot of um, information on it. I don't know if she's, she's going to pull that up or not. Sure, the, <clears throat> the habitat restoration resource center page. Yeah. We can come up with plans. Yeah. Thank you. I think what it was is like who who can guide us on uh, on where to find funding or or management recommendations? Um, I we can see their management recommendations on your website, which is great. Yeah, that's what I do. So on this page, it lists it lists several resources as well as um. I I don't know if it's farther down on further down on the yeah, get techno this click that gray box there yeah so this um this page here from there it has some resources um my contact contact information and um below that some additional you know resources that you can look at um through DCR um DER all of these various funding sources, but um, my contact information is here on this page as well as that last page of our PowerPoint. Are there other questions? Chat questions? Yeah, so there's two questions in the chat from Laura. Um, one is what's the minimum number of acres to be protected that to be eligible for those kinds of programs? Uh, I'll, let you, I'll ask, ask them separately. So that one first. <laughs> Okay, so it depends on the program, um, and I don't know those details. I do know with the wetland reserve program, it's kind of based on the soils, so they need to be hydric or wetland soils. Um, and I'm I'm really not sure about a minimum acreage for the healthy for forest reserve program. I apologize for not um, knowing that. Equip is one acre. Okay, yeah, I was going to say, is there a minimum acreage? <laughs> yeah, and so equip right they. They don't. Um, they don't have a minimum number of acres necessarily for for their programs per se. Um, yeah. So maybe best to contact your local NRCS office, but through our web page as well, they are listed there, and you could reach out to me also. Okay. So Laura also asks the or says that the. NYS DEC has a program that sells low cost trees for reforesting projects. Does Mass Wildlife have any kind of tree sale resources? No, we don't. We um we would not typically recommend planting trees. Um generally we would allow things to revegetate re naturally. So um, I don't, I'm not sure under what circumstances you really would be looking to plant trees, um, unless they might be, you know, chestnut or something like that, that's, that we're working to restore, but we don't have a tree, a tree sale program. So I have one just going off of that before we go to Van. Um, I've seen cases where people work on climate resilience and assisted migration of southern species up into. Is that something that Mass Wildlife participates in or any other Massachusetts government agencies? Not that I'm aware of, not, a, not in assisted migration. I think our approach at this point is to um, manage for resilient habitats and manage for native species as to the greatest extent possible to ensure that native species remain on the landscape, particularly with a focus on our state listed species and rare and declining species. Okay. Sam? Yeah. No, you, you just mentioned chestnut trees. Do you have any programs that uh, um, provide incentives for planting chestnut trees? The, the environmental Quality Incentive Program through NRCS does have a tree and shrub planting practice. Um, and so under that practice, I, I would think that folks could plant 
um, chestnut trees. I do. Um, there are a few organizations in the state as well that are um, that are working to restore chestnut. So those would be separate, you know, from the state agencies, but not to my, we don't have, Mass Wildlife doesn't have a specific program for chestnuts, but they do exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a good one for that is the American Chestnut Foundation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they do provide trees um, either through ordering or sometimes they'll send you seedlings yeah. to help assist with that. And I know some of those have, like where you plant a certain number of trees and then they test them you might know more about that and um to maintain like certain genetics within the trees that are growing um not exactly how sure how that works but i know some of the programs focus on that yeah so laura had um just a, some information about planting trees they say the research about oaks supporting so many pollinators and caterpillars on oak trees being important food for baby birds, caterpillars helping birds fledge. It seems like planting trees can be helpful for keeping birds alive. And um, mentions Doug Tallamy of the University of Delaware and Desiree Narongo at UMass, who've done a lot of research about this, these benefits of trees. So if anyone is interested in looking further into those. So what we are actively doing um, is managing our forest to promote oak, uh, you know, that's on its own so that it regenerates on its own. A lot of the work we do in our pitch pine scrub oak habitats for oak is, uh, scrub oak is an important host species, host plant for the lepidopteran species is um, just managing those and implementing prescribed burning, which promotes the growth of the scrub oak as well as oak, tree oaks. Um, so that's that's an approach that we would take um, to promote oak. It's funny that all over the world there's campaigns for tree planting everywhere but Massachusetts. It's kind of goofy. <laughs> we have a lot of forests in Massachusetts. We do have yeah, that. I mean, we have a landscape that's primarily forested and is reverting, you know, in, in many areas back to forest. And um Enabling the forest to regenerate on its own and the trees that are going to establish there are trees that are adapted to the conditions. And at times, you know, planting planting trees, they don't always survive because they're not necessarily adapted. And there's a lot of pressure from deer on young trees as well. So oftentimes you invest money in the tree planting and then you're defending them against deer or they're being eaten by deer. So it doesn't necessarily always seem to be the most cost-effective approach to regenerating trees. Actually, our equip grant is to beat back the trees on Sheep Hill. <laughs> yeah, well, depending on your habitat goal, right? Which is grassland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What are you managing? Are you trying to manage some something? We just have property. Mm -hmm. Just see what's available there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the subject of grasslands, or do you like that? I think it's mass lot, but wildlife is actually cutting forests down to restore. Well, it's ledge. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, That's what they're doing. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Because they say they need this grassland habitat going away. All right, so do we have any more questions from our online group or the person here? All right, so thank you everyone for coming tonight, both everyone who's attending online as well as everyone who joined us here at Cheap Hill. Thank you to Marianne and Sarah and Alec for hosting this presentation. I think um, we've learned from Biomap, uh, it's a great way to look at what's on your land and also how it fits into kind of a regional context, especially in this case of wildlife and plants that need to move around. And then Marianne has given us a lot of inter interesting, I'm really excited to go look through that list of rare species and blades down and try and find them. Yeah. But, and then also the resources. <laughs> 
want. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so that's all we have for this. Um, before everyone leaves, anybody who is in the area and associated with Williamstown Rural Lands, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a heads up about what's coming up. So next week we have our book group is meeting. We're reading a book called Becoming Wild, which is on animal cultures and society. You're welcome to come join our discussion, even if you haven't read the book. And uh, there's also a hike next Saturday, March 18th, starting at 11 a.m. at the Taconic Trail State Park. Uh, and I will be leading that, talking about pollinators and growing wild meadows, as well as uh, the geology and topography of our area. And then also, if anyone is interested, we're kind of starting to think about how we can turn knowing your wildlife or knowing your landscape into more of a working group. And so if anybody is interested in joining something like that, you can email me and we'll kind of include you into our little planning sessions. So other than that, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.